Hi there, and welcome to Ian's Engage channel. I'm Ian. Those who watch my new arrivals videos may remember that in my May update, one of the new arrivals was an ASU 53900 DCC decoder tester. I've been itching to try the decoder tester out, so in this video I'm going to take a first look and perform a few experiments with it. First, I'm going to figure out how to connect the decoder tester to a command station. I'm then going to connect the DCC decoder to the tester and, well, test it. Then I'm going to see if I can change some CV values on the decoder. But first, let's take a quick look at the decoder tester and check out what interfaces it has and what types of feedback it can give us. The ESU 53900 decoder tester can be used to ensure that a decoder is working correctly before it is installed into a locomotive. Should a decoder not be working when installed in a loco, testing it in the decoder tester can aid in determining whether the fault lies with the decoder or the locomotive wiring. The decoder tester supports multiple decoder interfaces, including a NEM651 or 6 pin socket, a NEM652 or 8 pin socket, a NEM660 or 21 MTC interface, a NEM658 or PLUX22 interface, a NEM662 or NEX18 socket, there's even an E24 or NEX28 socket on the tester, although this isn't mentioned in the manual, and I'm not completely sure if any locos are using this type of decoder yet. If you have a custom decoder, a decoder with a non-standard interface, or a decoder that has fly leads, they can be connected to the decoder tester using individual screw terminals. There's also an interface that allows an extension board to be connected to the decoder tester that can be used to test large-scale decoders, such as the Locksound XL, that are suitable for G-scale and more demanding O-scale models. To see the results of testing, there are several methods of feedback. The first is a cordless motor that incorporates a flywheel that allows you to check how the decoder handles low speed performance, momentum, smooth running capability and general motor control. There are also LEDs situated either side of the motor that indicate the direction of travel. More LEDs are used to indicate whether headlights, tail lights and other auxiliary functions are working correctly. More feedback can be provided by an integrated 20mm speaker, which when turned on can be switched between 100 ohms and 8 ohms. In terms of other connections, there's also two SUSY plugs that can be used to directly test external SUSY modules. It should be noted that the ASU decoder tester can be used to test compatible DCC decoders made by any company, and not just those manufactured by ASU. Ok, so, to use the decoder tester you have to connect it to the output of a DCC command station. The tester comes with a very convenient removable screw terminal connector, meaning that you can easily attach and detach the wires to and from a command station. Now, those who regularly follow my channel updates will know that I use jack plugs and sockets to connect my DCC command stations to the DCC bus. So, before I could connect a command station to the decoder tester, I needed to create a lead that would convert the decoder tester screw terminals into a jack plug socket. I roughly measured out about a metre of AWG 18 gauge wire and stripped the wire. This would allow me to move the decoder tester into a convenient position when using it in the train room, with either my Yamok or NCE power cab command stations. I fitted ferrules to one end of the wire. I then stripped the opposite ends of the wire. I used a pre-connected socket and lead rather than make up my own. I was so happy that I remembered to put the heat shrink onto the tail wires of the socket as it was usually something I only remembered when it was too late. Next, I had to tin the tail wires of the jack plug socket. 
I used a very helpful West Hill Wagon Works mini solder mate to hold the wires for me while I tinned them. Next, I tinned the wires on the extension cable. I then soldered the pair of wires together. Next, I slid the heat shrink over the joint to protect it. Oh, that's annoying. Okay, so that didn't work and was incredibly annoying considering that I had the foresight to add the heat shrink in the first place. So now I had to use a larger diameter heat shrink, which I slid along the wires after peeling them apart. I then used the soldering iron shaft to shrink the heat shrink over each joint. The next task was to connect one end of the extension lead to the ESU terminal block connector. The terminal block connector could then be connected to the decoder tester. Next, I connected a jack plug to the socket and got ready to test the lead for electrical connectivity. A multimeter was used in continuity mode to do this. I used the solder joints on the base of the decoder tester as a point of contact. Once the electrical testing was complete, I put away the multimeter and began the task of joining the two wires together. I used electrical tape to do this. It wasn't strictly necessary, but would make the extension lead a little easier to handle. Once I was happy with the lead, I headed to the train room to begin the actual decoder tester test. The first decoder I tested was a Bachmann 6-pin decoder made by Zimmo. After going through the usual rigmarole of working out which pin was the yellow pin, using a combination of information I found on the DCC wiki and Bachmann website, I inserted the decoder into the appropriate socket the correct way around. First, I decided to test the decoder in driver mode, so connected up my NCE power cab and switched it on. The green power lights illuminated and nothing went bang, so that was a good start. I dialed in the default decoder address of 3 and began to increase the throttle speed. As you can see the motor began to spin slowly and one of the two LED lights indicated that the motor was spinning in the forward direction which matched the setting on the controller. Next, I changed the direction on the power cab and watched as the motor slowed and then began to spin in the opposite direction. The direction indication LEDs also switched. I increased the speed to speed step 100 and watched the motor's speed gradually increase as the decoder's default momentum settings were applied. Once the motor had reached its goal, I set the speed to zero and watched how the motor slowed down again until finally reaching a stop.
Next, I set the motor spinning at speed step 100 again, this time in the opposite direction, and waited for the motor to catch up. While the motor was still spinning, I applied the active brake function, F2, and then set the speed to zero, and watched how much more quickly the motor came to a standstill. Once the motor had stopped spinning, I tried increasing the speed again, and the motor remained motionless. Until I released the active brake function, at which time, the motor started to spin up again. This was an excellent test of how Zimo's active braking works, and it was good to know that it could be simulated on the ESU decoder tester. The second decoder type I tried was a Next18 decoder. This was much more straightforward to fit to the tester, as it could only be inserted one way around. This decoder was obtained from Hatton's as an own brand decoder in their closing down sale, but I have no idea who actually manufactured it. This time I set the motor running at speed step 50 and noted that the correct direction LED had illuminated and that the default momentum settings were being applied as the motor speed rose gradually. Next I concentrated on the decoder's lighting functionality. I activated lighting on the power cab and watched as the headlight LED lit up as the motor was travelling in the forward direction. Next, I changed the direction of the motor. I noted that the headlight LED had gone out, and the tail light LED had now illuminated. Unfortunately, I didn't have a decoder with any other functionality, so I couldn't get the other LEDs to light up, but I was pretty pleased with what I'd been able to test so far. So next, I tried changing CV values. The obvious CV values to change for a first look at the decoder tester were those for the loco address. So I put the power cab into programming mode and chose to change the loco address. I entered the address that I wanted to change, which was obviously the default one. I then selected that I wanted to change the address to a long format address. I then entered the address that I wanted to change the decoder to, which was 3333. And that was that. But had the address of the decoder actually been changed? The power cab had handily already selected the new address for me, so I increased the speed to speed step 50. And hurrah! The motor began to spin up, and the decoder was now responding to its new address. Ok, so that's about it for this update. I think that the ASU DCC decoder tester is an excellent bit of kit. While I've only used it with 6-pin and Next18 non-sound decoders so far, its performance has been excellent. I can't wait to try it out with Hornby's HM7000 sound decoder that also featured in my May New Arrivals video. I'd love to know if you've got one of these decoder testers or maybe something similar from a different manufacturer. How do you rate your tester, and what use cases have you found for it? What's it good at, and what's it bad at? Does it work with all of the decoders you've tried testing, and if not, which ones did it fail with? Alternatively, if you've got any hints, tips, useful tools or techniques to pass on to a fellow N-Gage modeler, or if you simply want to say hello, then please do so in the comment section. Anything and everything you've got to say will be greatly appreciated. In the meantime, thanks ever so much for watching. Hopefully I'll have another update soon. Bye.